For, for me, the, the guiding principle is uh, to reduce the number of seconds that I hold fiat shitcoins. Hello there from Bedford in the UK. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got an interview with Max Hillebrand, where we're going to be discussing Bitcoin privacy. But before that, I do have a message from my show sponsors, and make sure you check them out. It's the sponsors who enable me to do all this work. So first up, we're going to talk about BlockFi, who are the future of Bitcoin and financial services. And firstly, just a big congratulations out there to Flory and Zach. They've just raised another massive round of funding which is a great indication of where the business is going. They've had, a, they've had an amazing couple of years. So congratulations, guys. Keep smashing it. So with BlockFi, you can open up an interest account and you can earn money on your Bitcoin. I'm a customer. I love getting my interest every month. And also using your Bitcoin as collateral, you can take out a USD loan. You can fund your BlockFi account directly from your Bitcoin wallet. And with so much more coming this year, I know they're going to smash it. If you're interested in finding out more, then do your own research and then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Also, we need to talk about the mighty Kraken, which is the very best place for trading Bitcoin. If you're new to Bitcoin, if you haven't gone out there and bought any yet and you're thinking, where am I going to do this? Which exchange am I going to use? Then you can do much better than going to Kraken. Why, though? Well, firstly... They have absolutely nailed the security. They are the most trusted cryptocurrency exchange out there. No dirty hacker is going to get hold of your Bitcoin. And with their 24-7, 365 customer support, whatever issue you have, you can reach out to them. They're going to help you whoever you are and wherever you are. And not only that, they have the most comprehensive suite of tools available for anyone wanting to buy Bitcoin. So at Kraken.com, it could not be easier to sign up and just start buying your first Bitcoin. They also have this beautiful mobile first app where you can buy Bitcoin on the go. With their margin trading, futures, and OTC desk, Kraken has every single option covered for you. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. If you want to find out more, head over to kraken.com, or you can download the app. It is available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Okay, so on to the show today, and I have Max Hillebrand on to discuss Bitcoin privacy, something that's been well overdue with Max. And this is really an interesting topic for me, because... It's one of those things, right? I understand how important privacy is, but using Bitcoin in a private way, it's really hard. Like the smallest mistake can leave a trail where people can track you down. And I know there are people out there like Max and Jameson Lop who nail this, but I'm just not technical enough and I don't really understand coin joining. I tried it, I had a play with it, it didn't make too much sense to me. And using Tor is just, it's not something I do. I almost feel like to get privacy right, I've got to start from scratch. I've got to change everything about what I do. And that comes with certain inconveniences as well. And I don't know, I'm just not ready yet. The trade-off isn't there for me, even though I know I should and I know I want it. Now, there are a lot of people out there working on abstracting away these difficulties. And a few weeks ago, I spoke to the guys at Start9 Labs who are doing some really interesting things. And I know Wasabi are really pushing things forward too. So I asked Max to come on the show and go through the steps everyone should be taking to increase their privacy. I hope you enjoy this one. If you've got any feedback, you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Also, I'm going to push you again to go and check out my other show, Defiance. I've been working for about three months now on this four-part documentary about this band, The Ghost Inside. It is the most fascinating story. I guarantee if you listen to this, you're going to be blown away, especially part two. That came out yesterday. It's a pretty emotional episode. I know it's brought a lot of people to tears. But if you want something interesting and different to listen to, definitely go and check that out. It's called 1,333 Days. It's available on Defiance. You can find that at defiance.news. Would love your feedback. Want to know what you think about it. Outside of that, have a great weekend, and I will see you all next week. Max, how are you? Hey, Peter. I'm fantastic. Thank you very much for the invite. Hey, no worries. I thought I'd lost you. I thought you disappeared. I was going to send out a search party for you. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm ready here, uh, full with a glass of water. Uh, so looking forward to our good conversation. Good, good. I got a good cup of tea going ready here. So so listen, uh, we're, we're going to talk a bit about Wasabi. And we're going to yes. talk a little bit about hacking and privacy and various things like that. Um, one of the interesting things about Bitcoin, you tend to find when you're debating somebody who doesn't really understand it. So for example, I was a guest on the podcast a few days ago, of quite a popular economics podcast in Ireland. And they said, they were talking about the various problems with Bitcoin, the same old stuff, you know, it's volatile, etc. But they said, um, you know, it's used a lot by criminals for money laundering, etc, etc. And we know that isn't 
particularly a large use case. But it's one of those things that kind of it kind of it's like a noose around the neck of Bitcoin sometimes. It does, never seems to go away. When you start talking about Wasabi, you have to deal with that a lot more because the majority of the time I see people discussing Wasabi, it's either someone like Matt O'Dell talking about how you should be using it for mixing your coins and or it is somebody using it for nefarious purposes. Is that frustrating for you? Uh, well, no, not really, I would say, because it's it's just part of the whole process, right? Wasabi is free software. Uh, that is that is first and foremost, right? Since since the very first uh, proof of concept code, everything was free software and published. Uh, so this means that uh, any person uh, can use this software to his own means for whatever reason. Uh, and there, there is no way for developers or for anyone uh, in that matter uh, to censor that, right? Uh, speech should not be censored. And the code that you run on your own hardware uh, should be completely up to you. And if you want to use the code that is provided in the Wasabi Wallet repository, uh, then sure, that's great. Uh, use it. It's it's a nice tool. But yeah. we can't compel you to use it and we cannot stop you from using it. Right. So this is an inherent part of, of Bitcoin. This this aspect of uh, anonym, anonymity or at least pseudonymity in a sense um, that exists on the Bitcoin base layer together with the permissionlessness of using the free software, running your own Bitcoin full node, uh, creating your private keys and receiving Bitcoin to them. Um, nobody can stop you from doing that. Right. And for a, a, a wallet, that is its main purpose. Right. Uh, if the wallet fails to allow you to send your money, uh, it's it's a critical bug. Like the, the this is the this is the core aspect of the wallet that should function. Um, and this, you know, includes all types. Uh, therefore, because it is inherent, I think it's it's a beautiful aspect of free software in general, rather than a hindrance or something that is blocking it. It is a very big enabler. So it's really a it's a really a mind shift in terms of how people think about money, about permissionless money, and it's really a a, a mind shift of of something that we're in the very early days of. People tend to criticize things like Bitcoin or even what you can do with something like Wasabi Wallet. But I think they tend to do it from the position of the traditional world of having a bank hold their money for them, knowing if their account gets hacked, the bank will usually return their funds, having the, in the world of chargebacks. We're, we're kind of shifting to this new world where you get to be self-sovereign and there are consequences. But I guess we're in the very early days of people learning about this and having access to the tools. Yes, absolutely. Right. The, the education is, is a huge, huge, huge part. Uh, because, you know, Bitcoin has been around for a while. The, the tools exist. Sure, the tools have gotten better and they continue to become better. Uh, but fundamentally, you can use them today already to a very great extent. The question is just, do you understand how to use the tool properly? Right. Uh, are you going to make some, uh, some mistakes while using the tool? Uh, and this is, of course, up to you, uh, the techniques that you know, the strategies that you know about and in, you know, the methods that you choose in order to satisfy the ends that you actually want to achieve, uh, how you're going to align the means available in order to, to reach the goals that you want to satisfy. Um, well, I still I still think Wasabi's a little bit of a nerd toy in terms of usage. And I also think there are people out there who just don't care. They're happy to buy Bitcoin, to speculate, to to be part of this Bitcoin economy, but they don't care that much about their privacy. They don't care about people knowing where their coins are. That's kind of like a reality of like a certain, I don't know what the percentage is, but a certain percentage of Bitcoiners. Uh, for sure, to both part, right? The, so the, the first part that Wasabi is a power user tool, uh, yes, it's a desktop wallet. It has many features that a power user would like. Uh, I personally would consider myself a power user of Wasabi, and I love it because it just provides uh, so many advanced features that I can play with. Uh, it's fantastic. How, however, I'm continuously surprised when I speak to new users of Wasabi. Uh, for example, when I do a workshop or just talk to a friend uh, and onboard them to Wasabi, you know, generate a wallet with them and send them their, their first Bitcoin often. Uh, I'm, ex I'm very surprised how intuitive some sense of the user experience is because Wasabi is very true to the Bitcoin user experience. Uh, you know, it's one of the few wallets that, for example, focuses so much on coin control. 
um, meaning that you actually see the individual unspent transaction outputs, the UTXOs that you control in your wallet that you have the private keys to. Um, and you actually select which one of these you want to spend, right? And each of them is nicely labeled and all of this. It's, it's a very different user experience to other wallets. But I'm surprised how soon new users somewhat get an intuitive understanding of how Bitcoin works, much more than with any other wallet. Uh, so why, why would you want mm -hmm. coin control? Uh, and this is me as one of those people who just wants to do everything like in the most simple and easy way. But for example, if I go to the shops today, well, I am, I've got to take my kids shopping, right? And uh, I'm going to take, say, £200 with me. I'm just going to, when I when I go to pay for something, I'm just going to give them the first note that's on the top. And my historically, my use of Bitcoin has always been a wallet has a balance. And when I go to send someone some Bitcoin or uh, uh, spend some Bitcoin, I just, I just for me, coin selection is automatic. I, I've got no idea if how it actually works and what even happens and i almost i almost don't want to know that i i but but there is obviously a reason that some people would so i tell you what let's do two things because some people listen to like this max they might not even know what wasabi is explain what wasabi is first and then let's talk about this coin control yeah, for sure. So, so Wasabi is a regular Bitcoin wallet, um, meaning it, it it has one primary uh, primary job, and that is to generate your private keys, which in the case of Wasabi is done on a hot computer, right? So, a computer that is connected to the internet, most likely your laptop or or desktop, uh, it is cr cross platform, so it runs on on Linux, macOS, and Windows. Uh, which is quite nice. Um, you you just download it, hopefully verify PGP signatures, and then uh, what you can do is generate your your own wallet with with a encryption password, uh, and you get your backup recovery words, uh, and you can generate receiving addresses. You can uh, receive Bitcoin to these, um, and then later send the coins that you have received. One important aspect about Wasabi is that on all levels, uh, it is a privacy first wallet. So with every design decision that was made, with every implementation decision, um, if there was a trade off between privacy and anything else, um, the, the, the default is to opt for privacy and to increase the privacy at the expense of other things. One of these is, for example, how your wallet finds out um, how you or if you actually have Bitcoin on the private keys uh, that you control. Um, and this is generally just how to check consensus for your wallet. And this can be done in different ways. If you're running Bitcoin Core or a, a different Bitcoin full node implementation, uh, you just can check all the blocks that you have already verified to see if there is a transaction that includes your address or your public keys uh, or your signatures. Uh, and you just parse the whole blockchain block for block and you see if this wallet has received any Bitcoin to it. Um, but the problem is not every user is running a full node, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the thing is, if you don't have the blocks, if you have not verified everything, how do you know if you actually have Bitcoin? Right. And so the, the short of it is you have to ask someone else. Uh, you have to ask or you have to communicate with someone else about the current consensus of the Bitcoin time chain uh, if it has blocks that contain your transactions. And you can do that in different ways. One very naive way to do it, uh, and that is unfortunately the, the most widely used way, which is also the very worst for the privacy, is that the user gives what is called his extended public key which is uh, a secret that is uh, just a large number, basically, uh, that is used to generate all the public keys of a wallet and all the associated addresses of a wallet. Uh, and whoever has knowledge of this extended public key does knows exactly all the addresses of one user uh, and therefore also all the transactions that the user makes. Uh, so he has the complete surveillance insight into everything that this user does. It's the biggest privacy fuck up that you can make, uh, pretty much, uh, to leak your entire transaction history to one trusted third party, which are always security holes, right? Which we see all the time, just recently with all these hacks happening. Which um, I almost certainly have done myself. <laughs> um, so, and you see, uh, Wasabi does it differently. Uh, with Wasabi, you do have a trusted third party. Um, by default, um, which which gives you the consensus of the Bitcoin time chain, um, and and this is specifically a a, a backend coordinating server uh, that is operated by default um, by the CK Snacks company, uh, which is an open source company that funds development in Wasabi uh, and the mm -hmm. main driver behind the project. You can run your own backend if you want to and, and change to any other coordinator that you want to and query your consensus that way. Uh, it's easily possible. Again, free and open source code, uh, you can run it if you want to. 
Uh, but the thing here is that the coordinator has a full node and all the blocks. And what the coordinator does is that it generates a BIP158 block filter. Um, it is basically a compressed version of a block. Instead of the, what, two and a half megabytes that a block is, it's a couple kilobytes. So orders of magnitude smaller in size. And it represents all the addresses and all the, uh, all the scripts that were used in this block. So all the signatures, basically, and all the public keys or addresses that were put into this block, they are referenced in here. And this block filter is sent from the backend coordinate or from the backend server to all the clients that connect to it and by default over Tor with new Tor identities. Um, so this way, your local Wasabi wallet will receive uh, all the block filters of the entire Bitcoin blockchain, which currently is roughly 300 megabytes compared to 300 gigabytes, right? And with this, you can locally on your own hardware check if any of the public keys of your extended public key in your wallet hit against one of these block filters. If you hit, you go to a random Bitcoin full node that is running on the Bitcoin network. Um, by the way, Wasabi packages Bitcoin D, the Bitcoin daemon um, that does basically all the stuff that a Bitcoin full node does. It's just running selectively. It does not do fair, uh, full verification yet, but it is used to connect to, for example, a different Bitcoin full node over Tor again with a new Tor identity. And you now download only this one specific block from this node as any other Bitcoin full node would download a block from a different node. Uh, at this step, Wasabi doesn't look any different than any other Bitcoin full node on the network. So you have the same privacy as any other Bitcoin full node that connects only to, only through Tor and only two other Tor um, Bitcoin full nodes. So no Tor exit nodes are involved. Everything stays in the Tor network. Um, and after this one block download, you actually disconnect from this node and you kill that Tor identity uh, and you generate a new Tor identity and connect to a different node to download the next block. Right. And this is how you get the Bitcoin consensus without ever leaking your extended public key, uh, which again for privacy is like the biggest fuck up that is avoided by default in Wasabi for any noob user. And, and here we come back a bit to the user experience part. This is where I think Wasabi's UX is fucking incredible. Specifically that part of the network level privacy, it is, it is the best network level privacy that you can basically get. You could even argue it's a bit better than running a Bitcoin Core full node, just because how smart Wasabi handles all this Tor stuff. So you never leak your XPUB, you still get the consensus. Um, and th this, th this is a phenomenal way by default, right? By default, all this Tor magic is done, all this filter magic is done um, to, to get you privately up to date with how much money you have in your wallet. Um, so, so here, again, this is where Wasabi shines, in my opinion. Which sounds amazing. And I think... If you're like a, I guess if you're a developer or a coder or, or if you're somebody who kind of has the time to focus on this, this is an, an amazing tool. But when you talk about all of that, I'm just like, huh, I'm, I'm lost. I don't, I don't even want to learn this. And, and, and I know that's going to really trigger some people. They're going to be like, well, you should. And if you, if you want privacy and you want to be self-sovereign, you should. But I just... It just these things don't really work for me because I'm, I'm not particularly technical and it just sounds like too much effort in some ways i'm kind of like the trade-off is like okay i i just don't have privacy because i can't i can't even get my head around this stuff but, but you see that I, this is this is where good tools come in because i absolutely agree with you bitcoin privacy is crazy complex and you need to be in really well knowledgeable about this whole topic in order to use Bitcoin privately at the current moment, specifically a couple of years ago. Uh, but the nice thing is we can build tools that make it easier for users uh, to do the best practices in privacy. And we've implemented many of these tools. Just one example is hierarchical deterministic wallets, which fixed one of the huge privacy fuckups, which is address reuse. Right? Every wallet has it implemented. You don't need to worry about how to generate a new address when you do it in your wallet. It just happens automatically. The same, for example, here now with Wasabi and this Tor setup. Previously to Wasabi, if you wanted to have such a Tor setup, you need to manually configure the Tor daemon and the Bitcoin daemon and do all of this stuff. Crazy complex. I would not be able to do that for sure, right? But with Wasabi, you just download the package and you run it and it works and you don't need to worry about it. All of this happens in the default. The, the only thing that you see in the GUI is that you're downloading and synchronizing the filters. 
Like, and this takes on the first start maybe two minutes or so, and afterwards it is it is really quick when you load the wallet again. So it's you know after a couple of minutes you're just up and running with Wasabi, and it works by default. And this is for users who don't want to care about all, how all the magic works. This is this is the best spot for them, right? Because it works by default. They don't need to change anything in the settings. They don't need to know how it works. Uh, and they just use it and it works. Uh, and this is, this is something like the, the prime aspect where I think that the Wasabi UX is phenomenally good for new users. There are other aspects that are not as good for sure, but the network level privacy really is superb. Which is, which is great. And I guess, I think even for some people, even Tor is a big jump for them because some of it isn't just usability. Some of it's kind of psychological. Um, I think a lot of people aren't really fully conscious, don't really fully care about some of the things that we're exposed to and we would talk about. So, for example, if I said to one of my friends, like, or if they got in touch, as is likely to happen over the next few weeks as Bitcoin keeps going up, and they said, oh, Pete, I need to get into Bitcoin. I said, oh, yeah, well, the first thing you want to do is get yourself a Tor browser and they'll be like, what? And I said, well, it's a way of you know, hiding your, um, um, protecting your privacy of use on the internet because you don't want people to know what you're doing with Bitcoin. They're going to be like, huh? I mean, these are people with Facebook accounts, right? So that is a big <laughs> jump. And, and I'm not saying we can't get people there, and, 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 and we should. But I guess I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit selfish here. But I guess what I want is I want a wallet whereby like everything is done for me. So when I send Bitcoin to my wallet, Everything is just done. It's just all the privacy is handled. All the addresses are handled automatically. All the necessary mixing is done automatically. I just want that. And do you think that's the, do you think that's a place we can get to? Oh, absolutely. For 100%. Um, so, but what, what we are already building on uh, and this is in Wasabi for, for years by now is a RPC server, which basically is a way for programmers to interact with the Wasabi wallet infrastructure without using the graphical user interface. So this is used by, for example, Bull Bitcoin, um, a Canadian Bitcoin exchange by Francis Pouliard uh, and others. Um, they, they do fantastic work there uh, and, and they use CoinJoin uh, to protect the privacy of their clients and they have a very elaborate backup setup with their, with their Cypher node backend that uses this Wasabi RPC server to do awesome cool stuff. And uh, so this is where programmers can use it. And there are other developer teams, not CK Snacks, the company developing specifically Wasabi Wallet, um, but there are other development teams who are working on, for example, a mobile wallet um, of Wasabi Wallet. It, it has the same code as the Wasabi Desktop Wallet, but a different user interface that is designed for mobile and where, again, as much as possible is automated. Um, so the, the coin joins can be automated and it's just send and receive uh, in a very nice user interface that does automatic coin selection by default with opt-in coin control. So, so th these are different user interfaces that, and there are several of these projects. I think three different teams working on mobile wallets uh, backed by Wasabi. Um, so, so this is coming for sure very, very soon, I hope. So that would be that, so that would be cool. So if I was to send Bitcoin to a wallet um, before the balance shows, it would go through the coin join process. Is that what you're saying? Um, yes, exactly. So so kind of the, the UX that I always envision is if if a user receives Bitcoin um, automatic automatically in the background, the wallet should make sure that these Bitcoin that were received gain some privacy. Uh, and that can be done by a variety of different techniques. Of course, in the case of Wasabi, uh, coin joins, right? So the, these received coins should automatically in the background be registered for coin joins because this process takes a while, right? Uh, a couple hours at least. Uh, if you want to do it right, maybe a couple of days, right? So this should all be done in the background. Um, and then uh, also further, right? Uh, when you spend coins, uh, this these transactions should also be some privacy conserving um, techniques and tools. Uh, so again, some um, you know uh, other coin join techniques, like for example, pay join is interesting, uh, or or just doing payments inside coin join, which is a big part of the research that we're doing right now with Wabi Sabi. Uh, you know what so would be cool. I'll tell you what would be cool. Sorry, I, I talked over you there. Do, do you want to finish what you were saying? No, no, no. Please go ahead, Peter. So, what, what, so I, I'm trying to envisage selfishly again the kind of wallet I would want. But I could imagine having almost two balances in there, which is my income in Bitcoin, so just a, a normal Bitcoin uh, wallet and address with a balance, and then my kind of, let's, let's say my um, 
anonymous Bitcoin, my private Bitcoin, the Bitcoin that has gone through the coin join. And as I receive any Bitcoin, wouldn't it be great if it says, oh, you've received I don't know, one Bitcoin and I could just like press a button and it would push that into the coin join. So I didn't have to do it every time, right? I could just do it. I could I could just choose to do it. But I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't even want to know about anonymity sets and all those additional options. I just want like really selfishly, I just want to pr- press a button and say, make these Make these Bitcoin anonymous. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's that's how it should be, right? Um, and and what you bring up here with these different different types of of coins that you have in your wallet, right? You said you have the the, the private coins um, that, that somehow were coin joined, and then you have the freshly received coins uh, where you know you still have some privacy downsides. Um, and that is absolutely right. Um, the UTXOs, the Bitcoin coins, the unspent transaction outputs are not fungible, right? Each of them is unique. Each of them has a unique address. Each of them has a unique am- amount, a unique transaction history, and so on, is in a unique block. Uh, so UTXOs are not fungible, and they will never be fungible, right? Um, it's an inherent design of how Bitcoin works. So the thing is, there are different types of coins that you own because each of them is unique. And so you can display them in different ways. Right. For example, you could have something that, that, as you proposed, with having different accounts, maybe. Right. So you have one account that has only uh, high anonymity set coin joint coins, and then you have a different account uh, for different receivers, uh, for example, or just one account for all receivers. And that is possible for sure. Um, and Wasabi does that too, but to the maximum extent, meaning that coins are ju- each of the coins is shown uniquely. It's like the each coin is its own account and has its own unique identifiers. Um, and uh, with this, you have a clear, a very clear and precise overview of where the coins you receive come from and if they have been coin joined already. Uh, and, and this is done in Wasabi already now. Of course, the user interface is not as nice uh, as it could be, but but that will hopefully change in the future. But the fun- fundamentally, this feature is here already existing in the in the core architecture of of the wallet and now the challenge is just to present this to the user intuitively right to to automate uh with with uh, good defaults that are privacy focused uh, and to package this in a nice user interface brilliant so it sounds like it's, it comes back to that point we're still just very early and i guess this is very difficult technology right it's very complicated and i guess what what you're building is tools for the power users and then over time you, you will learn how to work on the UX to make this a bit simpler for people like me. Exactly. I, th- I think Amazing. that is in general a, a good approach. You know? And it goes somewhat in line with that uh, free software uh, ethos of scratch your own itch. Right? Build the tools that you want to use yourself uh, because that gives you the right incentives, you know, the right motivations, you have fun on the, uh, while doing it and all this. Uh, so, so I think this is quite nice. And of course, then as, as it's free software, you share the work that you've made and let others use it too. And you get a benefit when others use it. Right? So you want to make it as user-friendly and intuitive for these guys to use it too, as this will increase the quality of your product. Okay, so listen, that sounds cool. And um, I know I annoy people when I talk about stuff like this, but I just, I talk to a lot of people who are interested in Bitcoin and look, there are different groups of people. There's some people who just want to buy it, the number goes up, sell it and make some money. Um, and then there's some people who are kind of a bit more interested in owning some long term for various reasons. But the, the amount of people who are like super worried about their privacy, who would consider uh, installing a Tor browser, who would really focus on you know, using a tool like Wasabi, it is it is a low number. Um, I'm not saying it, it, I, I, everyone should try it if they if they want to, but it's very cool that these things are coming. Okay, so let's let's talk about what happened with Twitter then, because this was really kind of interesting, right? So, what do we know about the Twitter hack? Uh, you know, actually, I personally don't know all too much about this. Um, okay. I, I, I was I was out of cyberspace actually as it happened, um, but but apparently, so there there was some social engineering going on with with one of the uh, Twitter company employees uh, or former employees or something, if I remember. And anyhow, he had he had access rights to some administrative uh, you know privileges in the Twitter uh, infrastructure, uh, and basically could use this to tweet uh, from other accounts. Uh, and uh, uh, somehow the hacker got access to these admin rights and then basically could tweet anything that he wants, uh, which makes sense, right? Uh, th- this is a centralized server. There's a trusted third party, which is, of course, Twitter uh, and the server infrastructure that they're running, and they can do whatever they want on their own hardware, um, obviously, right? So if the admins want to you know, delete accounts, they do it. If they want to tweet account, uh, tweet 
uh, something from a specific account, they do it. If they want to edit tweets, they do it. You know, if they want to uh, tweak search algorithms or like presentation algorithms, they do it. Uh, the, this, you know, it's it's their server. They do whatever they want, basically. Um, which again shows how much trusted third parties are security holes. And in this case, you see it again, um, just by that being exploited uh, by a malicious attacker. Right. Okay. But I was specifically asking with regards to Bitcoin because the Twitter hack was about, it was about, it was really a Bitcoin scam, right? And didn't, didn't the, um, didn't the hackers use Wasabi to mix the coins? Yeah, regarding it being a Bitcoin scam, for, for one, it was really a very low value scam. What I think fourteen Bitcoin or something. Uh, hey, like I'd really... like, uh, hey, I'd like fourteen Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure fourteen Bitcoin is nice, but it's you know it's like there, there have been much, much, much larger scam out there that that even still exists. So you know, the biggest Ponzi of them all, fiat, is is, is even larger. So you know, it's relatively small on scale. Uh, that's the one thing. It, it, it was a big publicity stunt. Right, because Twitter is huge, and because very high-profile accounts were were targeted by um, teenagers. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, so in this end, it was a great propaganda stunt, basically, uh, good marketing for Bitcoin. I'd say uh, everything is good for Bitcoin, <laughs> um, and that, that the hacker used Bitcoin. Well, obviously, you know, uh, uh, just you know, criminals are on the edge of uh, you know of of crime, and therefore they need to defend themselves, and they will use the tools that are most useful for them, uh, that uh, do the best job. And in the case of monetary freedom, uh, obviously, you want to use Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Are you are they going to post their their PayPal account uh, for for the idiots to send money to, <laughs> or their or, or yeah. their their bank account and and the IBAN number? Uh, no, of course not. Um, so the only tool that you can use for such a thing is Bitcoin, right? So this uh, obviously they they did the right choice here of, of utilizing Bitcoin in this. Um, you know, I don't condone their their actions. You know, hacking and all this is is, is not that nice. Uh, but still, using Bitcoin was was a smart choice for them. Yeah, and it isn't just them. I did the plus token, the plus token people. They use Wasabi as well, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Many people use Wasabi. Um, you know, there. Uh, that's again the thing with, with having a permissionless and you know specific yeah. anonymous nature. Um, CK Snacks, the company, um, they do not have KYC information. Not none at all. They only communicate with anonymous Tor identities, new ones for every round of communication. We have no idea how many users we have, where they are, uh, where they're from, um, or if, if, if this is this is the thing, right? Um, we, you know, CK Snacks, the company name is, is a twist on CK Snarks, uh, which is a cryptographic pr uh, protocol uh, to provide zero knowledge proofs. And uh, this, this means, you know, CK Snacks, the company, uh, would like to provide products where it has zero knowledge about its customers. Uh, that is really the goal of, uh, of the company, to not become a trusted third party, but to be a provider of tools and techniques in a way uh, that the provider cannot steal and spy and harass the users, uh, where, where this company does not need to be trusted at all. Um, for for all types of different things, we're not yet there. There are many aspects where currently um, the company is uh, still trusted. Not in the important cases, for example, the XPUB. The company doesn't have the XPUB, uh, obviously. Um, that you know, uh, so so that is important. Or company doesn't have IP addresses or or names or or shipping addresses or anything. Um, you know, just Tor identities. Uh, that, that's basically it. You know, therefore, we can't really do targeted censorship. If all you're communicating to is Tor identities, well, sorry, we can't uh, block any individual specifically because we don't know specifically which individuals are using uh, the service. So this is a feature. Well, yeah. I mean, look, like I get it. I accept it. I accept the reality of, of what it all means. But I guess this is where we can get into some of the more tricky subjects to discuss because am I right in thinking Coinbase blocked they blocked some people from sending bitcoin to the people who take overtaken the twitter accounts do you, are you aware of this yeah yeah exactly and it shows again right trusted third party or security holes you know they can just uh, they can stop you from using your money um well there's they... two there's two there's two things there right so firstly they can stop you so so there is a an issue there where whereby they censored the transactions but i guess everybody they did censor would have been glad in that scenario they did 
So it's a really tricky, it's a tricky one, right? Um, well, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, the question is, do you want to have that protection, right? Do you want to have that that uh, guardian over your shoulder, uh, that big brother watching uh, over every action you take? And when that big brother thinks that the action that you take is stupid, uh, he can prevent you from doing it. Um, if that is something that you want to have, sure, go for it, right? Uh, do what thou wilt. But the, uh, I don't want that. Uh, I don't want to have big brother watching over me. Uh, like no, a but, but you're smart. Uh, you're a smart Bitcoiner, right? You're, you're not a moron. You're not gonna. You're not gonna see Obama tweet out that. Oh, send me uh, one Bitcoin, and I'll send you two back. You're not gonna do that at all, right? But my my brother might, or my father might, and having that extra layer of protection from Coinbase, they would have been glad about. And that's why well, I say it's a sure. tricky subject. I'm not saying it's right. I just say it's a tricky subject. Sure. No, no, no. I, I absolutely agree. That's that's what I meant earlier. It's a valuable service to have this in, in some circumstances. Uh, you know, specifically for larger amounts um, uh, that, that you want to protect, you do want to have some, you know, uh, checks and third-party eyes watching over uh, and, you know, confirming um, uh, procedures. This is a very, very important aspect of, of custodianship specifically. Um, uh, and, you know, the cool thing is with Bitcoin, you can do such custodianship uh, or, or such uh, security checks by a provided company or by a third party uh, in a trust minimized way or trust reduced way uh, by utilizing, for example, multi six or whatever. Uh, so you can do a lot of cool stuff like this already and, and use it. And obviously it's useful uh, for sure. I don't question this at all. Like having these security features um, is, is great. You just need to be aware of the trade off that if this is naively implemented as it is with most current uh, custodian pro accounts, this means that your trusted third party has full control over the money and you have zero control over the money, right? So so the trade-off here is that you give all of the control to someone else and you get presumably a lot of security from it, uh, undoubtedly. I mean, we see how many of these uh, full custodians uh, were stolen from. Um, uh, and then, you know, the, the but this doesn't mean that the technology itself of having these um, semi-trusted or trust-reduced parties um, to be... Uh, an active part of making a transaction is is very important. Uh, and again, we have these techniques with multi-signatures, with from your secret sharing, with vault constructions and advanced time lock things. This is all possible and it's good that it's possible. We just need to be aware of the trade-offs that we choose. Next up, I talked to Max more about Bitcoin privacy, but before that, I've got a message from my amazing sponsors. So first up, we've got Sportsbet, sportsbet.io, the best place for online gaming. And they accept Bitcoin because they're badasses. I'm going to be going out to see them soon. I'm going to catch up with the team soon, find out what's going on. And we're coming to the end of the football season. We've got a couple of games left, a couple of finals to figure out. The Europa League and the Champions League final. I'm fascinated by the Champions League final. I think PSG versus Bayern, I think, is going to be a cracking game. I think I'm going to have a bet. Kind of fancy Bayern, though. I think PSG always fail. Now, listen, if you do want to get a bet in before the end of the season, you've got these last two games, you can do it over at sportsbet.io. And like I said, they accept Bitcoin. Also, looking forward to next season. I'm going to be doing some fun things with Sportsbet. Going to be looking at ways we can jazz things up with the football season. How we can laugh at Tottenham losing every week. And how we can all celebrate Liverpool probably winning another title. Now listen, if you want to find out more about Sportsbet, head over to their website, sportsbet.io. And like I said, they are the best in online gaming and they accept Bitcoin. And really, they're just a bunch of badasses. So go check that out. Also, let's talk about Casa. They are also the best at what they do. They are the absolute best in Bitcoin security. So good. I love this product so much. I actually got Nick Newman, the new CEO, and Jameson Lop on the show. I wanted to talk about the product. It's really changed my experience with Bitcoin. This little nagging, little nagging Jameson Lop who sits on my shoulder, constantly tapping at me and going, Pete, get your shit together. Your security is all over the place. That's been dealt with. Now that I'm a Casa customer, I have so much peace of mind, not worrying about all the stupid things that I can do, all the risks I have with my Bitcoin. Now, if you have not been taking your security seriously, if you've been leaving Bitcoin on exchange, or you're worried about holding it yourself, or worried about the risk of a single hardware wallet, now is the time to check out Casa. And they have a solution for every Bitcoin out there. With their Casa Gold product, you get triple the security of a hardware wallet, and it only costs $10 a month. That's such a small amount if you want to improve your Bitcoin security. With their Casa Platinum, which this is the one I use, right? This is where you get their three or five multi-sig, which is the best protection for large Bitcoin holders. You know, it comes at a solid price. 
And with their Casa Diamond, you get the full service offering, including customized personal security review, inheritance, and of course, their best in class security. There is no better time to upgrade your Bitcoin security and get total peace of mind. You can find out more at keys.casa, which is K E Y S dot C A S A. This is where it gets super interesting, right? Because um, I don't keep any amount of Bitcoin on an exchange ever. Now, I, I'm one of those people who is fully. Um, self-sovereign to the point now I've got a Casa multi-sig I've distributed my keys I've kind of got myself to a place where I, I don't have to worry about a personal fuck up someone attacking me yeah I'm in a really good position and that's taken you know that's taken me a couple of years originally I was on an exchange then I had a hardware wallet then I had a couple of hardware wallets and and then I you know, rather have my keys backed up on like a, a piece of paper I, you know, I used a bill fodder I've gone through those stages over the space of a couple of years and like I'm in a position that really suits me now and I'm happy with it but but there are and this this will trigger people I think there are certain people who will want exposure to Bitcoin who will also not even would should use a custodial solution and that's really going to piss people off but like my dad for example like every time I go and see him in Ireland He's got a list of things I have to do for him. You know, it's, his TV isn't connecting to his DVD player or, or there's a problem on his computer. Like, technically, he hasn't got a Scooby, right? He's just... And he never will. The idea of him having a hardware wallet, backing up his private keys, or having any kind of multi-sig, it's not even like we could go on a journey and teach him. It's just not going to happen. It's beyond him. Right? So I think there are certain scenarios where people sh- should use a custodial solution and accept the trade-offs. And also some people who therefore would also benefit from the custodial solution having things in place which protects them from maybe sending Bitcoin to some kind of hacker or something. And that means we we end For up sure. with this kind of, this, I guess, this, I don't want to say layers because that's like misleading, but this kind of like two different Bitcoin worlds. As the, there is the completely self-sovereign, permissionless, trustless world of Bitcoin, which I use and you use. But then we also have the, this semi-trusted version, which will suit some people. How does that fit with you? Does that sit comfortably with you or does that bother you? Oh, no, for sure. This is this is how it ought to be. Uh, you know, there, there, there will be um, hundreds of thousands of different wallets out there uh, provided uh, in, in free software form uh, and, and many different forks and versions and, and uh, releases of each of these. Um, so, so hopefully, hopefully we will see a, a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, and and plenty full of options to choose from uh, for individuals uh, because this this will allow individuals to to choose the tool that aligns well with their own individual preferences so for your uncle the risk of him fucking up by you know losing the the paper backup that he made uh, while being confused is a lot higher uh, than a reputable custodian uh, with good and well audited uh, security uh, to be stolen from or to steal from from the uncle um, and therefore you know it, it, is, it is a rational choice for him to to use that tool which has less risk for him uh, which provides him with less uncertainty uh, which is the, the main reason to use money and that will be the custodian and there's nothing wrong with this again it's based on individual preferences uh, and and it's it's a good thing to have but but still we, we ought to strive to to provide easy to use tools to, that reduce that trust on a third party. Uh, that is the first thing. So to make these tools more user friendly, as well as providing more reputable, better audited, better insured, trusted third parties uh, that even, that in the case, uh, or first, that are well defended against most cases of being stolen from. And second, that in the case that they are being stolen from, that they out of their own capital reserves or insurance contracts uh, pay out uh, to their users uh, who have uh, custodied, uh, custodied their precious Bitcoin with them. Um, so we're very early in this stage. There is a lot, a lot of work to be done on many, many fronts. Um, so, so for sure, this will all come and it's good that it will come. But it's just natural that we don't yet have it uh, because nobody built it. But that's that's kind of practical of you to say that, and that not everyone will agree with this. There are people who will say that you should never hold your Bitcoin with a, a trusted third party. You should self custody everything. Um, if you're not running a node, you're not verifying your own coins. Like there's this high bar that some people think 
should exist. But it seems like you're a bit more comfortable with a kind of lower bar for for other people. Well, I, I set that very high bar for myself, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, I make that happen for myself. Uh, but I do not force other individuals uh, who have their own unique preferences and value judgments uh, to make the same decisions that I do. Uh, I, I will most certainly um, educate them and, and help them uh, to make a, a well-based decision on, on how to act and for them to realize the, the trade-offs between these different options. Um, and again, for me also to, to, to build on the tools and to, to make them better for both myself and for others, um, th- this, this, is, this is my approach. Um, so I do have that very high line for myself, but I don't see why I should enforce this on others. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, it is a tricky thing. Dan Held talks about this sometimes as well. You know, he's talked about the fact that custodial solutions will suit some people. And also, I think, we didn't we just see like... Can we just see this like new law or regulation change uh, in New York, maybe that banks can now custody, let's say cryptocurrency, because I think it was broader than Bitcoin for people. So it is a reality that's coming. Is it potentially dangerous, though, if there were too many people custody in their Bitcoin with custody solutions? Is, does that present any risk or dangers to Bitcoin itself? Any kind of like wider risk if too many Bitcoins were secured like that? Uh, y- yes, I do think so. Uh, Gregory Maxwell has a very insightful comment somewhere in the archives uh, of cyberspace, and I'm, I won't butcher his quote. Uh, but, but you know, basically, the idea of Bitcoin is a network of individuals finding consensus, uh, and the the issue is. J- you know, it's a it's a very you know individualistic network. There, these are actual people uh, demanding to be paid in Bitcoin uh, and verifying that they have received Bitcoin. Uh, and this means that if these individuals uh, are well aligned in in their thoughts and their motivations, uh, in, in in their vision, then they reach consensus. Um, however, if there is a, a fork, basically, if there is a divergence of, of um, you know, method or uh, or vision or, or goals, basically, to achieve, uh, then then we disrupt the network, uh, and this is not good. And this happens in Bitcoin, of course, on a technical level, right? If you run a different consensus uh, implementation or a different different node implementation that reaches a different state of of the network, um, th- then you have a fork. But it also happens on the social layer, right? So. Bitcoin only works because individuals defend their rights of using Bitcoin. Uh, and if more and more of these individuals um, do not appreciate having this tool available and do not use it to its fullest, uh, fullest extent, uh, and rather um, g- go down for the convenience and the, the security of using a uh, less responsible, less self-responsible uh, option out there, um, that risk is, is here. And if this happens on a wider scale, then the, the ethos of Bitcoin is broken. Uh, and, and that can for sure lead to the downfall of, of the project. Uh, it would not be the, the first time. Uh, so um, this is why education is so primarily fucking important, uh, because you need to have a well-educated base of peers of, of individuals who understand the reasons why bitcoin why this is so important why we are actually doing this uh, and why having this tool is such a valuable resource and something worth fighting for and something worth to build and to make greater uh, and all you know all of these aspects don't come out of nothing uh, they actually do have to be fought for uh, and uh, over and over and over again uh, and you know the, the work that that educators do like all the great podcasts uh, out there and the YouTubers and, and journalists and, and uh, whatnot, of course, Peter, you included. Uh, th- this th- this is why this is so important. This is why this is such a great work. Why, why do you care so much, Max? Why have you made this your essentially your life's work? Uh, first and foremost, because I need these tools myself. Uh, I, I want to protect my property. Uh, I want to protect my life uh, and my liberties. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin is a phenomenal tool for that. Uh, if you know the, the the capital that you hold in Bitcoin on your own private keys, verified on your own full note, uh, is completely seizure resistant. Um, if, if done properly, nobody can uh, steal this money from you directly uh, via theft of the coins. And, and no indirect theft uh, because of the um, increase in the money supply. So because I verify everything on my full note. Therefore, Bitcoin is a phenomenal tool for me to protect my property rights. And I want the tool to be functional. Um, therefore, I build uh, pro or I, I, I contribute to the, the tools that I need, which, for example, used to be BISC, a decentralized exchange to uh, exchange my fiat shit for Bitcoin. I wanted to have a, a <laughs> common version of that. So I contributed to it, made it a bit better. Um, and uh, then 
then used it myself. Now I no longer have any fiat, so unfortunately I no longer enjoy the use of BISC. <laughs> but uh, are you a hundred percent Bitcoin? Uh, yes, I earn Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin, and spend Bitcoin. Oh, let, let's talk about this. Because okay. <laughs> I've thought about this, right? I've thought about this. I've thought about doing making that full commitment. And it's funny, if I'd have done that two years ago, I would be wealthier than I am today when comparing the value of my Bitcoin uh, to the pound. If, I, if I'd have done, run the exchange right then and now, I would be a lot more wealthy. But I haven't. So there's a couple of reasons. Okay, so I have a house, right? I have to pay my mortgage. Um, and I also have two kids and various things I have to pay for for them. So there's always this need to be transferring money back into the local currency. Um, you can tell me as much as you want about this or keep as much to yourself because some of this might be private. But do you still have to operate a fiat currency bank account to deal with certain things which are in fiat? Or have you managed to put your entire life into Bitcoin and everything you pay for uses Bitcoin? Um, so I only had a bank account for three years of my life, um, which was in a period where I actually uh, did uh, my bachelor's degree cooperatively uh, at the Deutsche Bank. So I worked a bit mm -hmm. in the belly of the beast for three years. And that is when I had a bank account to receive that salary. Um, I rarely used that bank account, actually, mainly to withdraw cash, uh, which is the way that I, you, the only reasonable way for me to, uh, to use uh, and interact with fiat. Uh, and then as soon as that uh, that bachelor's degree was finished uh, and I quit uh, the work at, at Deutsche Bank, I also quit my bank account. So for over a year now, I no longer have a bank account at all. Um, no PayPal, no credit cards, no debit cards, nothing. And I earn all my, I, or I demand uh, from all of the clients that I work with uh, to be paid in Bitcoin. Um, therefore, I no longer have any income that is denominated in fiat. Uh, or, or that is paid on in fiat rather. And then I hold Bitcoin uh, and that's it. That's that's um, by now both my store value medium of exchange and unit of account. I no longer see the, the fiat value of, of Bitcoin. Um, that doesn't change. In, in my Wasabi wallet, I only see the quantity of Bitcoin that I have and that doesn't change. Uh, only, it only changes when I earn more or when I spend. But how, how do you say price your, like if you were going to do some work for somebody, how do you price that work? Do you have a, like a fixed daily rate which is bitcoin and it doesn't matter if the price of bitcoin doubles that's going to be your fixed daily rate or do you adjust for the changes in the price so all of my contracts are denominated in uh, bitcoin um, meaning that i th there's a certain amount of bitcoin that i charge per hour or per day or month or whatever the the, the contract is and uh, every month that is the same which you know this is reasonable Bitcoin is, is a very stable currency i know that this is exactly the percentage of the money supply that i get um every month it's not it's well, very hold on hold on hold on hold on it's not really a st stable currency and, and it depends how you look at it. you could say it's stable because fiat is unstable right but but most people are still using like fiat as their unit of account so you know if bitcoin was to do say say i don't know say you charged a daily rate of 0.1 bitcoin about a thousand dollars and bitcoin did a 10x and you're still charging 0.1 you, you to those people your 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 rate might have gone up to ten thousand dollars a day if you if you, you you, you for see sure. what I'm getting at. For, for sure, yeah. absolutely. But, and, but you know what you can do as a smart entrepreneur then is to give a discount. You can say, hey, guys, uh, um, Bitcoin did great. You know what? You get a 50% discount on my services. That sounds a lot better, right? That, that's a nice way to sell it. But it's still a... F yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I don't disagree with it. And it's very cool that you're using it as your unit account. But if I was buying services from you, I'd be like, well, hold on, Max. Bitcoin's gone up 10x, even with a 50% discount. That's like a 5x price I've got to pay. Okay, okay sure. Then, then we negotiate, right? I mean, you, you can do yeah. negotiations of price. And and I regularly do that. Um, well, I, I also would do that if, if it's denominated in fiat. You know how, like, the, the fiat is such a shit coin. I, like, the, the nominal <laughs> amount of the, of the currency that I receive needs to increase drastically with every month, basically. Um, it, like it's insane the amount of inflation that we have, right? So, so yeah. I want to adjust that price too. But, but you see that if if I earn fiat shitcoin, I I need to negotiate to increase my salary, right? That is a very weak uh, negotiation position, right? Because now I need to beg uh, the, the other party, hey, please, 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 give me more money for the same service that I provide you, right? That is a difficult sell. Ah. On, on my side, I can say no, no, you pay me Bitcoin, and if Bitcoin is doing well, I can say you know what, I give you a discount. Right, that is that is a nah, lot. I'm, I'm in a yeah. much stronger argumentative uh, position uh, to to argue uh, for for uh, the value that that I receive in exchange. 
Now I want to get now I want to get paid by everyone in Bitcoin. You see? Damn you. Yeah, but do you know what I do? I still I actually have one one of my sponsors pays me in Bitcoin and I right. used to uh, historically 75% of everything I receive in Bitcoin gets transferred into pounds and I have a pound bank account to because all the services that I have to use, the hosting, everything. I have I do have to pay in like pounds or dollars and sure. the people I pay. So I I, ha- I had to do that. Um, but recently, the last time I got paid, I left it all in Bitcoin. But I did it at a time like Bitcoin was nine two, and then we've gone up to like eleven twelve hundred, so uh, eleven to twelve thousand. So like I made the right decision at some point. But if I if I'd have built them when it was twenty thousand, and and that gone down to being worth like five thousand, that that would have a material impact on me running the business. Sure, like, yeah. I I would like to do it, but I can't because it's too risky. So my my risk I was willing to take was like. 25% of every invoice I'll leave in Bitcoin. Um, so I'm tr- I would say I'm I'm part way towards what you're doing. But let me ask you. you, you know, no, like, but, but you see, that, 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 that's great. And uh, this, for, even for me, this was not a you know, one moment change. Uh, this, this is something that I've, I've built for many years now, right? Uh, and it's for sure a step-by-step process. And of course, you know, mm-hmm. at first all my income was in fiat, then a little bit of it. Right, and I was super happy. It was in Bitcoin, I mean, and I was super happy. But but you know, another nice trick that I did was, uh, at you know, at first I said, okay, um, pay me point one Bitcoin. Um, that that's my salary. And if the person says, I don't know about Bitcoin, I don't have any, then I say, okay, you pay in fiat, but you pay fifty percent more. Because then I have to take care of converting that fiat into Bitcoin and I have all that cost and I need to worry about my bank account. This is a huge amount of extra cost that I have. I'm only willing to give you that service if you pay me in fiat, but more of it, right? So again, wow. the, no, no, actually the, 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 your customer basically is punished for giving you shit because I'm, I'm not a waste disposal company. Like I don't want to get rid of shit. That's not the business that I do, right? So I, if if you want to outsource that to me, like I have a, a huge amount of trouble and he- headache and don't want to do it. Uh, so you have to pay for that service if you if you actually want me to do that. Uh, and later I increased that amount. So it was like you pay double. Eventually even you pay triple if you dare to even ask me if I accept fiat. Um, and now I'm at a position where I say, if you ask me if I can take your fiat, I say no. Um, there, I like the, the price would have to be extremely, extremely high uh, for me to take your fiat shit, which is nice that I that, that I am at such a good um, uh, you know argumentative position to actually make that claim and, and to defend it. Um, but if I don't get paid in Bitcoin, I will not do the job. Do you know what's super interesting? Right, ten years ago, eleven years ago, Bitcoin was basically used by a few kind of nerds and techie and people interested in this new interest and bit of money. And over time, we've, you know, we've 11 years has passed and you know, pretty much everyone's heard of Bitcoin and a lot of people have it and a lot of people are, are using it. And I guess like there's like this trailing group of people like yourself who have gone, you've just gone in, you've gone full Bitcoin. You're like you said, you're, you're, you've, you've essentially become part of that Bitcoin circular economy whereby you are only holding Bitcoin and only spending, only receiving Bitcoin. And I guess over time, maybe in 11 years time, there'll be more people doing that, but you'll, you're like one of the early uh, adopters of that concept. I do know other people are doing it, but it, it oh, always sure. seems I mean, were, scary to me. Le, le, I mean, I'm for sure not the first one uh, and oh, yeah. for sure not the last. Um, you know, w- one guy who, who really inspired me was Felix Weiss, um, uh, a guy ah, with Felix. And I believe it was 2012 or 2013. He made that what, what I'm basically doing now. Um, went all in Bitcoin. I even believe he quit his bank account. I'm not exactly sure. And wow. the only way he, so he earned Bitcoin. Uh, and then he exchanged some Bitcoin for cash locally on a peer-to-peer market. Um, so yeah, and then th- with that fiat cash that you get from a peer-to-peer trade, um, uh, you you buy the goods and services that you cannot acquire uh, with with Bitcoin directly. Um, and for him, that worked. I believe he was out for like a year or so, traveling to oh, 40, 40 different countries or, or whatnot. And again, it worked for me the, the same way. I th- th- over the last year or so, um, I don't know, maybe 15 different countries without a bank account, without any credit cards, uh, just with Bitcoin and the local fiat shitcoin that they prefer to use. And that's it. And it works surprisingly phenomenally well. Have you run into any difficulties with this? Um, none that were too challenging not to solve. Um, 
I mean, I'm sure there are, there, there are some inconveniences. You know, for example, in, in every country that I first uh, come into, I somehow need to find a person to do a Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer trade with in person. And that is not always easy. You know, the, the big benefit for me here is, is that, I, you know, go to a bunch of Bitcoin events and, and do a lot of uh, in-person education too. Uh, so I do meet Bitcoiners and usually Bitcoiners who want to get more Bitcoin. And again, I'm on the easy side of the trade, right? I want to give my precious Bitcoin uh, to another hodler. Like this is the easy side, right? They want to get rid of the shitcoin. That you know, that that's difficult. That's where you need the waste disposal uh, facility. Uh, so again, selling Bitcoin is is a better position than buying Bitcoin, in my opinion. Um, do you have like um? Do you have like a like a like a backup option? Like, what if you got to a country and you could not trade some of your Bitcoin? Like, do you um, carry a few dollars with you just in case, or? Uh, well, well, yeah, sure. I, I do have some reserves in, in fiat. Yeah. For, for me, the, the guiding principle is uh, to reduce the number of seconds that I hold fiat shitcoins. Um, that <laughs> needs to be reduced to a minimum. So the reserves that I have are really tight. <laughs> and um, it, it can for sure be. It, it happened that I was a couple a couple days, a couple weeks, completely without any fiat shitcoin at all. Both because well, I didn't need it because I had enough food and fuel uh, for whatever I needed. Uh, plus that I did not find other people to trade with. Um, that for sure can happen. And yes, that does increase your uncertainty. Uh, absolutely. You know, there are always ways to figure this out. Uh, and uh, so far it has always worked. But yes, this is some aspect where uncertainty is, is introduced. And that, of course, is a friction uh, that you have to deal with. Um, but for me personally, uh, the quantity of liberty that I uh, have made for myself with this strategy um, so incredibly far outweighs any inconvenience that I had uh, that I, it is a no-brainer decision for me. I, listen, I would, uh, I kind of envy it. The freedom, like if I didn't have kids, I could imagine a scenario mm -hmm. where I sell ev sell everything, sell my house, my cars, all my bullshit, put into Bitcoin, and just kind of roam around the world, like living this kind of free life, doing as I choose, blah blah blah. But because I've got these other responsibilities, I can't do it yet. But I. I definitely envy it. It does sound amazing. Yeah, together it, eventually. It it is it is for sure fun, but but to say that you can't do it is is a bit harsh too. I mean, well, it's a struggle. Um, like, I, th there's yeah. a lot of complicated things that I would have to think through to be able to do it. But that's not to say it's impossible. But also, the, like, there there is a financial risk with it because fiat is a shitcoin, right? Of course, I understand that. But but over certain time periods, your wealth in Bitcoin can you know can drop heavily. Um, you know, if you have a bull run and then you go into a bear market during that period, it may be have been financially better to hold your fiat shitcoin. You know, for sure, for sure. But th the thing is here, specifically with me, I'm just such a very fundamentalist uh, Austrian economist that huh. personally, I just do not care about the exchange rate of different uh, currencies. This is something that I'm, as a monetary economist, not that much interested in. Um, the whole, the main point of view for me is the monetary supply aspect. And this is where I draw the basis for my economic and entrepreneurial calculation, uh, for, for my wealth measurement, uh, and for, for other parts. Like I know exactly the percentage of the Bitcoin money supply that I own. Um, and mm -hmm. this, this is a, this is incredible. Uh, this helps me so much with my calculation of what, uh, if, is it worth it to invest my Bitcoin into a good or service that I want to purchase? Um, and this, uh, this is, you know, one aspect where therefore I just really don't care about the price. I really don't. Um, and it, it's, it, I, I get it why, why other people care about it because of course fiat is, is the main baseline, but you know, for me, it's, it's just Bitcoin is by far the most stable and, and, uh, secure and most optimal trust trade off asset that I could hold, uh, in order to build my capital stock to save for future investments. Um, and it, when you look at it from that aspect, uh, it's, it's as stable as it can be. It's interesting. I've just calculated what percentage of Bitcoin I own, right? I don't think I've particularly got a large amount of Bitcoin. Like certainly haven't not like well under triple figures, right? I've just not got a lot. But when I run it as a percentage, and I think, wow, if this was like the primary currency of the world, the primary global currency and 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 uh, store of wealth, as a percentage, it still looks kind of interesting. You see, I'm kind of like. Yeah, not yeah. many other people could be that high. Yeah, that's exactly. kind of cool. Exactly. Maybe I get this, it, dude. Th this is what entrepreneurial calculation is about. 
not the exchange rate of, of, of other currencies, right? Um, th th this is what, what the, that fundamental medium of exchange value comes from, right? What percentage of that medium of exchange do you have, right? That is your purchasing power. Uh, and this is what I base my economical calculation on. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, as you say, it's, it's, a, it's such an interesting shift of perspective. And I think it's such a meaningful one um, to, to, to get this, this new baseline. This is what a sound monetary economy is built on. It's individuals and entrepreneurs having that shift of a mindset. So interesting. I, I think basically what I need to do is kick my kids out. I'm <laughs> my kids <laughs> I could do that. No, look, I'm gradually getting it. Like I say, I mean, you know, I store I mean, about half of my wealth is in Bitcoin, right? That doesn't give anything away because you know, people don't know what I have, but about half of it is. And in terms of running my business, you know, I think about 25% of it is held in Bitcoin. And it's definitely a growing number. Like in both of them, I, I'm I'm definitely the percentage of what is Bitcoin measured against dollars, right? Or pounds is definitely growing. Like I'm, yeah. I've got a decreasing amount of the fiat shitcoin. But to get to that point where I'm entirely on, I guess there's another benefit from that. Like if you have full privacy, yeah, you know, and you fully understand what you're doing with your privacy and you're doing your coin joins and then you're getting into a local market and you're exchanging some of the local currency, you're only ever dealing in either your Bitcoin or cash in the local market. So you're not leaving any kind of trail, which I guess is another benefit. You know, that, that is it. And that always uh, is something where I kind of have to smile a bit when people say Bitcoin is not private or, or Wasabi is not private. I'm like, D good luck trying to find my Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, like I, I've never leaked my ex I uh, like the, the receiving addresses are always freshly generated, a whole bunch of coin join. And I receive them from people that you do not know that they send me money. Um, and I, I will send it to people who you do not know that I sent them to. And you have no clue the link in between between these um so if you know if you use bitcoin properly good luck uh, dude, I'm dude. Possible, but and you could totally roam around the planet and not paying any tax if you so wish to i'm i'm not I a resident you do I'm, I'm not a resident of, of any uh government jurisdiction what how how is that because you're just roaming or have you like is your yeah. base somewhere like weird um, no, no, just roaming, um, you know, just um, roaming. Uh, uh, traveling uh, and seeing nice places. Um, so, and you're, so essentially your income goes up by like 40% at least because you're not having to pay any tax. I, I tend to think it's a lot more. Um, I mean, I, I don't pay any income tax. That's the one thing. I also, you know, reduce all the social uh, insurance. I, I do not have any government mandated social insurance and all this shit. So this falls apart too. Um uh, and further, the most important thing, um, I do not pay any inflation tax. Uh, and, and, and this is what I mean with reducing the quantity of seconds uh, that I hold fiat shitcoin is sp specifically for this. Um, every second that you hold shitcoin, you're being stolen from. Uh, you're being taxed yeah. every single second. Um, so the longer you hold it, the more money is being printed and you don't get it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, this, this is the shitty thing. Uh, so that whole tax falls out of, uh, out of the market completely for me. So there's, of course, still a lot of looting that is going on. I mean, I don't even mm -hmm. want to know what percentage of tax they steal from diesel uh, or, or from, from steak or whatnot. And uh, I don't even want to know the, the whole quantity of, of tax that has occurred just on a structural um, basis by the amount of malinvestment and overproduction uh, that this fiat fire has caused. The total cost of, of this entire fiasco uh, is, is tremendous. So I'm not saying that I'm not being stolen from. I'm just saying that I try to reduce this as much as possible. I'm actually going to sit down with the kids now and have a chat and say, look, we're about to change our lives. We're about to roam the world. <laughs> Listen, this was amazing. Love this, Max. Honestly, there, there are, I've, I've met several families uh, who, who travel with, uh, with their kids. You know, uh, both parents and two or three kids. Um, it's, it's definitely possible. You know, it's, uh, for sure there are, there are, there are many trade-offs and, and uh, it's, a, it's a careful decision to be made. But it's, it's possible for sure. Yeah. And a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, I would, lo I would love to do it. It's a bit, little bit more complicated for various other reasons, but I, I mean, I would absolutely love to do it. Um, this is amazing. I didn't even think we were getting into this. This is very cool. All right, listen, look, great to talk to you, Max. Can you tell people if they want to follow your work, they want to see what you're doing, if they want to get it, reach out to you, how do they get hold of you, man? 
Uh, yeah, um, Twitter is of course always a good uh, good spot uh, at Hillebrand Max. Uh, GitHub more and more too. Basically, uh, under this pseudonymous uh, identity of Max Hillebrand, you can find me in cyberspace. That's not even uh, you. Toward- <laughs> well, uh, it, it is one of the pseudonymous identities that I choose to reveal myself under. And uh, so, so towards liberty.com as the website, of course, a lot of the work that, uh, that I do is, is focused right now on Wasabi, which, by the way, we didn't even uh, get a chance to talk about it. Um, by the time this episode is, is, re- um, is released, probably, uh, we will release the next version of Wasabi, uh, which, is, which is quite nice, uh, version 1.1.12, 1. 1. uh, which has a bunch of major upgrades. Uh, so, so that's been, been quite a fun. So stay tuned for some announcement there. We should. Have we met? Uh, yes, in uh, um, Munich, we, Germany. Lightning Day. Yep. I thought we did. Yep. I thought we met at, at, at the Lightning Day. Amazing. Yeah. All right, well, look, I love this. Really enjoyed this. We should do this again sometime. I think I want to do a bit more of a deep dive sometime about living on Bitcoin because I think that's a super interesting topic. But <laughs> th- look, thanks for coming on. Um, I look forward to the more user-friendly products, which are more unlike me needs. But keep doing the good work and stay in touch. If you ever need anything, you know you can reach out to me, Max. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Peter, again for the invite. Uh, it was, was fun to chat uh, about all these. Again, important topics uh, to have a conversation about. And as I mentioned earlier, it's it's incredibly important to have educators out there uh, to to spread that knowledge and to help other peers understand it. Uh, so thanks, Peter, for all the work that you do uh, with so many good episodes no. and good hosts uh, and good guests also. Uh, so Thanks, man. Okay, so what did you think of that? Are you going to go out there? Are you going to sell your house and turn into a Bitcoin nomad like Max? That's pretty cool, right? I didn't know Max was 100% Bitcoin, and that really is a next-level move. I know some people are. It's not something I can do yet. It's just practically not possible for me right now. Maybe if I didn't have kids, maybe it's something I could do. But I do envy it, and I do love his conviction in Bitcoin. It's, it's really fucking cool, right? So I would definitely try and get Max back on the show. I want to discuss this more. That's a topic I really want to explore. I really find that interesting. Also on the privacy, yeah, it's one of those things I know I like. I need to sit down and really think it through and really figure out what it is I can and can't do and what is a practical you know, privacy solution for me on a day-to-day basis. So something I'll definitely be looking at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. You know if you've got any feedback, you can reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. If you want to support the show, just head over to my website, whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. That explains everything you can do. Really, though, I just want you to go and check out Defiance. I want you to go and check out this four-part documentary I've been making about this band, The Ghost Inside. I'm really proud of the work. Danny, my producer, has done an amazing job. I think it's our best work so far. It's called 1,333 Days. You can find it at defiance.news. Parts 1 and 2 are out, and I think you'll enjoy it. And I'd love your feedback on that as well. Please feel free to get back to me on that if you do check it out. Outside of that, have a great weekend, and I'll see you all next week.